Hi everybody. I wanted to do a lecture here today on aromaticity and what classifies something as being aromatic or not. So there are plenty of um, videos in my YouTube channel that talk about aromatic reactions and electron donating groups, electron withdrawing groups, but I wanted to focus here for a minute or two on what actually makes a compound aromatic. So many students are familiar with the fact that benzene is aromatic, but they have trouble in terms of classifying other compounds as aromatic. And it turns out we can classify a compound as aromatic by using three simple rules that we have to follow. And the way that the rules are listed, they normally go from least complex to most complex. So the first rule is going to be very obvious, very easy to determine. And then you have the second, which is a little more difficult, and then the third. Uh, but if you get enough experience, you should be fine with this. So let's take a look at these. Number one, the first rule is that the compound must be cyclic. All right, so when we're talking about this, this is an easy requirement. So what do we mean by cyclic? It has to be some sort of a ring system. So in other words, benzene, which we all know is aromatic, is in a ring formation, right? The p orbitals are locked in to that ring formation. Whereas one of the common dienes, 1,3-butadiene, this is not a ring system. So while it is conjugated, it's not cyclic. And one of the requirements, the first one in order to be aromatic, is that you must be cyclic in terms of the compound. All right, so number two, the next rule is that it must be conjugated at all points around the ring. So you must have p orbital, okay, and the term conjugation, we're going to come back to this in a second, um, is not just alternating single and double bonds, although a lot of students uh, start with that. So p orbital conjugation at all locations in the ring. And what goes along with this is that the ring system must be flat. It needs to be planar in order to be considered aromatic. Now, I will tell you, it is very difficult for most undergraduate students, it's even difficult a lot of times for me as a professor, to determine just by looking at something if it's going to be flat or not. And there are plenty of examples, we'll go through a few in later lectures, where you can come across something you would expect that it might be flat, but it turns out that it can bend into some weird shape or, you know, like a, a tub shape or something like that, and it turns out to not be aromatic because it is not planar. It sort of warps itself. So we'll look at some examples, but in general, what we're going to assume here is if we have sp or sp2 hybridization at every single point around the ring, then we will assume that we're dealing with a flat molecule. That's the general assumption we're going to make. Again, I'll teach you a few exceptions to the rule as we go on, but in general, that's what we're looking at. So for instance, benzene, which we have up here, every single carbon is involved in a pi bond, making every single carbon sp2. Now remember, sp2 hybridization is dealing with trigonal planar. So think about the term trigonal meaning triangular, planar meaning flat. So whenever we have all sp2 locations around the ring, that means that the entire ring should be trigonal planar or flat in nature. And so this is usually easy to determine if you have a bunch of pi bonds, but sometimes it can be a little bit trickier. So let me show you an example where it might not be as obvious. If I have a compound like this, okay, it is cyclic, and then I take a look, I've got double bonds here, but this carbon right here is a carbocation. So the question is, is this conjugated at all points? Now, a lot of students will have a tendency to say, no, it's not, because you know you have the pi bond on the left, you have the pi bond on the right, but in terms of the double single double rule, all right, the conjugation here, we have a double single, a double, but then I have two single bonds up here, right? So if that's the case, then they say it's not conjugated. Well, that's not exactly true. You have a p orbital where this carbocation is. And the true definition of conjugation is p orbital overlap, continuous p orbital overlap. And so the fact that I have p orbitals at these other spots here, the carbocation keeps that going. The p orbital doesn't necessarily have to currently have 
pi electrons residing in it, although through resonance you would argue that it could, it's just the fact that you have to have the p orbitals overlapping one another. So the true definition of conjugation is continuous p orbital overlap. Okay, so this right here would meet definition two. So if I had a ring and that ring had a positive charge here and then had two pi bonds like that, that would meet the definition of p orbital conjugation at every single point along the ring. And I would expect this to be a planar type of compound. So number three, the last rule that we have to meet if we pass these two is something known as Huckel's rule. All right. Now Huckel's rule is really a mathematical derivation that uh, comes from MO theory, molecular orbital theory. So you have bonding orbitals, you can potentially have non-bonding orbitals, and then you have anti-bonding orbitals. And the idea is aromatic compounds are going to fill their pi electrons into only bonding orbitals. So if a cyclic conjugated system has electrons, pi electrons, in the non-bonding or the anti-bonding orbitals, it's actually going to be classified as something called anti-aromatic. And that is very different than aromatic. It's the complete opposite. It's very uh, non-stable. It's very unstable in that case. So what is Huckel's rule? The mathematical rule is you have 4n plus 2 equals your pi electrons. All right. And the rule states that if n is going to be equal to an integer, so 0, 1, 2, 3, etc., you can continue forward with that whole number integers then the compound, provided it meets rule one and two, is going to be considered aromatic. All right? And if you have anything other than that, so if you have one half, three fourths, any sort of number like that with n, then at that point, you are going to be dealing with a system that would not be aromatic. And there's two definitions. We can have non-aromatic or anti-aromatic. So we're going to have to sort of sort through those in a minute. So if you take a look, the most commonly well-known aromatic structure is benzene. So does benzene obey Huckel's rule? Well, 4n plus 2 equals how many pi electrons are in benzene? For every double bond, you would get two pi electrons, right? There's one, two electrons here, there's one, two here, so now we're up to four, and there's one, two here, so there's a total of six. Six pi electrons. So if I mathematically start working through this, I would just take two from each side, and then I would have 4n equals 4. So I divide that through, and then n equals 1. So if I have 6 pi electrons, according to Huckel's rule, I could be in an aromatic state. And indeed, benzene is an aromatic compound. So these are the three rules. Think about it in relationship to benzene. It must be cyclic, right? You must have p orbital conjugation or overlap at every point in the ring. So what this is really saying is you need to have sp2 or sp hybridization. It's almost always sp2, but you have to you cannot have sp3s found anywhere in your ring because those are tetrahedral, they're not planar, and if you're sp3, then you've used up all of your p orbitals for conjugation. You don't have any of them left for overlap. Okay, that's the whole idea behind sp3. So when we talk about something that's sp3, we're saying that we hybridized the one s orbital we had available and all three p orbitals that we had available. So if all three get brought into the hybridization process, I no longer have a p orbital. So how on earth could I conjugate with the other p orbitals in the surrounding area? All right, so sp3 carbons or nitrogens or oxygens, any of that type of stuff, will ruin your aromaticity if you have a lack of p orbital in that spot all right and then again huckel's rule when we talk about huckel's rule you need to solve for n and n should come out to a whole integer so you can sort of some people i usually suggest because i'm not a huge fan of memorization to actually solve for huckel's rule so just know huckel's rule and then you can solve for it but you can memorize it's not that difficult the sets of pi electrons that would constitute something being aromatic. So in a case like that, uh, what you would need to think of is, okay, when, when would the number of pi electrons make n equal a whole integer? Well, we just saw that 6 is one of those numbers, and that makes n equals 1. So then it turns out that 2 
right? If I put 2 there, 2 minus 2 would be 0. So that would be 0 as my integer. And then I could have 10 because if I have 10 minus 2, so think about what I'm saying here. I'm saying if I have 4n plus 2 equals 10, so if I take 10 minus 2, that's going to be 8, right? So then 4n equals 8 means that n is going to equal 2 when I algebraically solve for it. So I could have 10, and then the next one would be 14. So where do these numbers come from? I'm adding 4, right, each time that I increase here. So it turns out that when you have cyclic systems, and they're conjugated at every single point, if you have any of these sets of pi electrons, they're going to fill up all of their bonding orbitals, and they won't interfere with any of the non-bonding or anti-bonding uh, orbitals as far as their energy levels. All right, so then things that wouldn't work because you have pi electrons that would be found in those non-bonding or anti-bonding orbitals would be examples where you have 4, 8, 12, right, etc. And in this case, you're going to, if you have this many pi electrons, you're usually going to be classified as anti aromatic. All right, so those are the three rules. We've got, you must be cyclic, you must have p orbital overlap or a completely conjugated cyclic system, and then you have to obey Huckel's rule. And note that if there's things outside of the aromatic system, that's okay. So in other words, let's say that I have a CH3 here, right, on the benzene. This would be sp3, but that doesn't ruin it because this is not part of the aromatic ring system. It's what's enclosed in that cyclic system that has to meet the, the perfect conjugation rule, not substituents or other things that are outside of that. All right, so that's an important side note there. All right, so if you can understand this, then you should be able to start classifying aromatic compounds. All right, and I will mention that there's going to be a lecture on when lone pairs will contribute to aromaticity or not. And that confuses a lot of students because sometimes lone pairs will be found in a p orbital and then sometimes lone pairs will not be found in a p orbital. And the question is whether or not they're going to be in a p orbital or not because then they can contribute as pi electrons. So we will talk about that coming up. All right, so let's, I'm going to clear the board here just for a second because what I want to focus on is the three definitions we just discussed aromatic. So what is non-aromatic and what is anti-aromatic? And, you know, what are what's the deal with those? So if you have something that is aromatic, it means that it passed all three rules. So you had success for all three rules that pass. Okay, so we can just say it passes all three rules. Now, that means it's aromatic. Aromatic compounds are highly stable, so these are going to be very stable compounds, even more than we would have originally predicted if we calculated the energy values of all the double bonds. That additional conjugation that's locked into a cyclic form creates even greater stability than we would expect. All right, and then we have anti-aromatic compounds. So what are these things that we keep talking about that are anti-aromatic? All right, and by the very sense of the word, anti, it means they're the complete opposite of aromatics. All right, so if, if we end up passing 1 and 2, so if a system is cyclic and fully conjugated, so we're passing rule 1 and 2, but we fail rule 3. So in other words, we fail Huckel's rule. Okay. If that occurs, the system will be anti-aromatic. If it's cyclic and it's completely conjugated, but then it fails Huckel's rule, this is going to be anti-aromatic. These are highly unstable. Okay, so these are not favored compounds. In fact, many anti-aromatic compounds will attempt to sort of disassemble or rearrange themselves into a better form because they want to get away from the anti-aromatic state. It's very difficult to create anti-aromatic compounds. We talk about them in theory, but they're going to be very difficult to create in a lab because they have such poor energy. All right. And again, that's due to when you think about filling up the antibonding orbitals that are very high in energy with these pi electrons. It's not going to be a good situation. All right. And then the last type of definition we can have is something that's called non-aromatic. All right. Now, to be non-aromatic, 
simply means you're not an aromatic system, but you're not necessarily anti-aromatic. So non-aromatics, you're kind of indifferent. They could be stable, all right? Many of them are stable. However, you do not count them as anti-aromatic. So when you fail rule one or two, and again, rule one is must be cyclic, rule two is conjugated at all spots, then you simply have a non-aromatic compound. And this is not aromatic or anti-aromatic, it's just somewhere in the middle. So we don't really rank these as far as very stable or horribly unstable. They would just be compounds, all right? They're just non-aromatic compounds. They're certainly not going to be as stable as aromatic compounds, but they wouldn't be as unstable or non-stable as the anti-aromatic compounds. So uh, at this point, if you fail rule one or two, you shouldn't even be looking at Huckel's rule. There's no point in going through and looking at Huckel's rule, all right, if you fail one or two, because you Huckel's rule comes after you've passed the first two criteria. That's the final test to see if something's aromatic. If you say, oh, I, here's my compound, I have an open chain like this, right? Is this aromatic? No, because rule one has been failed. It's not cyclic. You stop at that point. I don't need to worry if it's completely conjugated. I don't need to worry if it equals 4n plus 2 pi electrons as a whole integer. There's nothing you need to do after that. It's just non-aromatic and you move on. All right. So that concludes this lecture as far as defining what makes something aromatic or not. We've obviously only talked about one or two examples here, so the next goal is to get some examples under our belt so that we can really start determining whether things are aromatic, anti-aromatic, or non-aromatic now that we know the working definition and what we need to do. So, as always, thank you for your support with the channel. Comments, likes, and subscriptions always help, and I will see you guys next time. Thank you so much for learning with us.